thanks very much for asking to attend the Living with the Street Dog webinar. I've been really surprised and really pleased by the response. And I think part of the reason for that is that um, so many people now are adopting street dogs or are bringing street dogs over to the UK or to another country and um, then are finding that there's certain problems involved with helping the dogs to settle in. Um, in fact, two people who were going to be here this evening um, emailed me and said that they weren't able to come because um, two separate lots of dogs had escaped um, who'd just been brought into the country and they were out searching for them. So, you know, there's, there's a number of kind of issues that are involved that it's very important to be aware of um, with a free-ranging dog. And so what I'll be doing, obviously, with some of the dogs who are brought over, um, they settle in very well. One particular friend of mine has got a dear little dog who just settled in as soon as she arrived. She, was, she came over from Romania. She'd been following people around in the streets. Had obviously lived in a home before, was extremely socialised with humans, and, um, and was desperately trying to get somebody to take her home with them. And in the end... Um, the people who've been observing her, the rescue have been observing her for some time, and they ended up taking her in and rehoming her with a friend of mine in the UK. And she's an absolute delight of a dog. She's got no issues whatsoever. Um, really lovely, easy going, friendly dog, which you know is very refreshing because in the work that I do. I tend to work with the dogs who've got issues, who've got problems. Um, so I'll kind of start off by just telling you a little bit about me, for those of you who don't know me. So I'm an accredited animal behaviourist with a distinction in canine psychology. and the principal of the International School for Canine Psychology and Behaviour, or the ISCP as it's known. I founded the Dog Welfare Alliance um, about four years ago now. Um, I'm chair of the Association of Interdogs, which is an organisation for um, professionals who use only positive methods. It was actually the first organisation um, to be founded for positive professionals. Uh, there's lots of them around now. Um, I'm the representative for Interdogs on the Animal Behaviour and Training Council, the ABTC, and we're the first non-founder organisation to be accepted um, behaviour organisation to be accepted by the ABTC. Um, I'm on the education committee for the Pet Professional Guild and I write books and articles as well. Um, so there's, there's kind of a lot going on in the dog world especially but I, I write books about other things too. But my, my big passion I would say is dogs and working with dogs and I specialise in fearful dogs, rescue dogs um, and I tend to work and get called in to work with a lot of dogs who have been imported. Um, and I adopted a street dog, well, feral dog myself, um, back in 2013, um, called Charlie. And here he is. So this is Charlie. Charlie is the boy at the back. Um, with Lenny in the foreground, both of them were captured at the same time. Um, in Romania, we we don't know everything about his background. We do know um, from information that I've had from the rescue in Romania that um, they've been tracking Charlie for about 20 months before he was caught. When he was photographed here, it was from a distance and zoomed in, and he had both his eyes working fully there. Um, when he was caught 20 months later, one of his eyes was very, very badly damaged and had to be removed. And um, then he was sent over to England and I fostered him and I ended up adopting him a couple of weeks later. He, he came over through Blind Dog Rescue, who funded his eye surgery and his uterine and everything. Lenny was also brought over and is doing very well now in a home. Um, you can see with the body language of the dogs, Lenny is more confident, um, he's at the front, he had some aggression issues when he was first adopted but has settled down, it's taken him a while, but he's settled down really, really well now. Um, Charlie, in the background, you can see how scared he is, 
he's he's got the typical feral dog facing something unfamiliar um, posture of very lowered body aeroplane ears raised paw um, you can just see everything about him is saying actually i'm really nervous about you so this was charlie when he was pretty young we don't really know how old he was when he was brought to me um, on his passport it said he was about 19 months um, but in fact that photo was taken around the time of the birthday on his passport so that was about 20 months beforehand so you know we think he was at least three or so um, probably three to four this is his captor which pretty unusual sorry about the interference i'm just trying to find oh, no. um charlie being caught unusually he didn't resist he didn't show any signs of aggression and he literally just flattened to the ground it turned out that that was charlie's classic response when he was scared during the first six months especially if anything made him frightened, if anybody approached him, he would flatten to the ground. And, and so it was actually quite easy to catch him, where very often the captures of, of the street dog and feral dogs are absolutely horrendous, um, very traumatic for them. Um, very often they react aggressively, and it's no wonder, because they're utterly terrified. Um, so Charlie just flattened to the floor and it, it was pretty simple with him but you can see the damage to his left eye in this photo and Charlie at the vets in Romania waiting to have his eye removed absolutely terrified everything in his body is just screaming please get away from me um, you can see he's got a direct stare which is quite unusual and it was something that I found was very peculiar to Charlie that however frightened he was whatever situation he was in he always made eye contact usually a very hard stare and then later on as he blossomed with us as he learned to relax and, and cope with life in a home then you would get the soft gaze it was absolutely lovely the first time i saw this that he was utterly terrified at this point 18 months later this is charlie whizzing past my daughter amber and sky my lurcher and me in the garden um checking in on me as he goes past i absolutely love this photo of him because it's so joyful and big grin on his face big grin on sky's face on everyone's faces in fact and everything in him is saying i am having a wonderful time and charlie and sky with me charlie um went from the most fearful dog I'd ever met, and I've met some very scared dogs, um, to a cuddle bunny, basically. It, it took quite a long time, but this really is to show you that it can be done. You just have to put the work in with these dogs, and it does involve a lot of work and a lot of commitment. <clears throat> so, street dogs there's a big difference between street dogs and feral dogs and i wanted to explain that here for you they're either born in the street or they're born in a home and then they're abandoned um, they're familiar with the presence of dogs because they follow people around um, they get fed um, they find scraps um, around places where there's people some people actually feed them as well so they're kind of dependent on the people around them even though they're homeless um, if they've been treated well, like the dog I mentioned at the beginning who my friend adopted, then they follow people around. Some of them are just desperate to interact with people and are very friendly. Others are more scared because they've experienced abuse. Um, it's a very hard life. Starvation, disease, terrible cruelty that goes on with a lot of these dogs, which I'm sure lots of you will have seen horrific photos on Facebook um, and other social media traffic accidents as well because they live in the streets um, <coughs> we'll be um, talking briefly with um, Aurelie and Stefan later on who is with us from Romania who is the um, medical director for Animal Spain Uta International who sees all of these dogs firsthand and treats and works with them and helps them 
feral dogs are different. Um, people tend to think of feral dogs as dogs who've lived in a home and then have gone off for whatever reason, either been abandoned or were actually born in the wild and are able to live independently of people. Very often people call stray dogs feral dogs. Um, there is actually a big difference scientifically. They're born in the wild. They tend to live in small groups. Um, there's very little research been done on feral dogs. Scientists who've done the majority of the research on the feralization of domestic dogs um, is Mark Beckoff and Tom Daniels. And Mark Beckoff sent me all of the papers that they've written when Charlie first came to me. And I was trying to figure out what could have been going on in his background to make him the dog that he was, to make him so extraordinarily fearful for him to have um, such a terror of everything. And um, all I knew was that he was feral. So the papers were very interesting. And the research that I've done through having Charlie with me and talking to other scientists has been very useful because up until now, there's never been any research done into the domestication of a feral dog. Um, there's been lots of research now into the um, feralization of domestic dogs, um, but not the other way around. And of course, the dogs that a lot of us um, would be dealing with if we have um, feral dogs sent to us and turn off people's microphones as we speak. Because I can hear quite a lot of background noise from somebody. Um, the only research that has been done so far into the domestication of a feral dog is with a dog in Italy in Turin called Parsifal. Um, Mark Beckel told me about him. Um, he was taken in. Uh, there, there will be a paper written about him at some point, but it hasn't been written yet. Um, and Mark travelled over and met him, and he said that if he had looked any different, if he looked more husky-like, he would have been convinced that, in fact, he was mostly wolf. And that's because the behavior of true feral dogs is much more wolf-like than dog-like. Um, there's a genetic disposition to extreme fearfulness of anything unknown. So that's people, um, anything different in the environment. Um, the amygdala in the limbic system, in the middle of the brain, is the organ that translates information to emotions that then prompts hormones to be released, especially the flight fight hormones. So that's adrenaline, norepinephrine, and cortisol. Um, and that tells you when to run, when to stop, when to fight. Um, with feral dogs, the amygdala is very highly developed um, because they've absorbed this through their parents. It's something that there is a genetic change when dogs are born in the wild and then they breed in the wild, um, that they, they're they born with this innate fearfulness because they've inherited it basically from the parents. Um, the territorial range is very small, but they do defend it very fiercely. They are extremely territorial over that range. I was surprised at how small it is. It's probably about the size of a small field for most of these dogs. Um, and um, But they don't like other dogs coming in. They're not promiscuous like our dogs are and like street dogs are. When a street dog is in season, she'll mate with anybody who happens to be around. Um, with feral dogs, they'll only mate with familiar males within a certain radius of the area that, that they live in, their territorial range. Um, and they will drive off actively um, other males from outside that area. Um, so there's lots of kind of ideas behind why that could be. Um, Tom Daniels and Mark Beckoff wrote a paper about it, the social organization of free-ranging urban dogs, groups in the mating system. And it, it, the most likely reason is that um, those males are more or less in the environment. They're in the locality, so they can be involved in the raising of the pups. Um, the pups leave very early much earlier than wolf pups do, who tend to stick around until there's been other litters born and quite often will take care of the litters. Feral dogs, once they're weaned, very often 
they will go off and make their own way in the world. So there's an incredibly high mortality rate with them. A lot of them don't survive. They either starve or they freeze to death or they're attacked by other dogs um, or harmed by people. They find it very difficult to adjust to captivity because of the extreme fearfulness. It's not like a fear that has come through having a bad experience and then you can gradually desensitize the dog, counter condition um, so that it, he learns to cope. This is an inborn um, quality that they have. They are extremely fearful. A lot of the dogs don't survive the harsh winters, the street dogs and the feral dogs. Um, it's absolutely heartbreaking to see all the photos of these dogs covered in snow. Capture is horrific for most of them. Um, extreme cruelty. The catch poles, well, you can see with the heartbreaking photo here, um, the dogs are just dragged along. They're half strangled. Um, very often they're fighting. That poor dog can't, can't get away at all. It can't fight at all. Um, so very often the dogs are phobic about collars and leads. A lot of the dogs are phobic about men, don't like being handled, don't like their heads and necks being touched. And it's, it's totally understandable why this is. Um, so please bear that in mind with any dogs who are coming to you um, to be extremely careful around the neck area. Luckily, some dogs are caught more compassionately by rescuers or like Charlie, my dog, um, they will flatten to the ground in fear. They'll be paralyzed literally with fear um, so that they at least don't endure immense pain. And life in a public shelter. There's a lot of dogs in one place. Some, in some shelters, there's hundreds of dogs. Um, lots of competition for food. There isn't always much food available. Quite often, there'll be a week between meals with some of the dogs, depending on which shelter it is. A lot of fundraising is done by the rescue people in order to find the money for food for the dogs. Um, there is competition over food, over space. Fights can be to the death because they can't escape each other. They're, they've been um, living free and suddenly they're in this captive environment. They're caged and they can't get away. There's more likelihood of disease spreading. And of course, there aren't the funds for enough vet care for all of these dogs. Um, so if there is a medical problem that is infectious, then it's very likely to spread. It's very hard to make assessments of whether a dog is dog friendly, person friendly, child friendly. Um, very few rescues can do cat testing uh, because there just aren't the resources. There aren't the people available to do it. It's the wrong environment. Um, very often there's no handling in large shelters. I've known of several cases um, where dogs I've worked with, in one particular instance, the adopter had been told that the dog was a very nervous female um, who was absolutely lovely but tended to be rather nervous and you know didn't want to be touched but was going to be fine once she was in the home. In fact, when the dog arrived, it turned out that he was male because the people at the shelter hadn't been able to get close enough to the dog to discover what sex he was and he was utterly terrified. Um, so there isn't much done in the way of assessment. It's just impossible. In the small rescues, it's different. They can do assessments more. And the ones who send dogs out to foster, you can get a more accurate assessment of the dog. So looking for a home for, for the dogs. Um, this year, in January, in fact, last week, uh, Defra released the figures for the numbers of dogs imported to the UK in 2015, and they're actually quite shocking. 93,424 dogs were imported to the UK. 33,249 of those that we know of um, came from Lithuania, Hungary, Romania, Poland, and Ireland. That's the five top puppy farm countries. Um, and so the RSPCA has launched its Scrap the Puppy Trade campaign now to try and do something about this. Um, how do People put the word out about dogs needing homes. Um, social media is the main 
arena, um, UK and UK, USA rescues, overseas rescues, um, independent rescuers who just happen to have a Facebook page and take in a few dogs, um, will post on social media, people will cross post, and then somebody will see one of the photos and say, I've fallen in love with that dog, I really want that dog. Um, in an ideal world, we would have liaising going on with overseas rescues and rescues in the country where the dogs are being imported to. So that is in an ideal world, it doesn't always happen. Some of the dogs are just sent over from um, Romania or Lithuania, um, whichever country, Bulgaria as well. Um, they'll be sent over, just shipped by the person who has taken in the dog um, through a transport company to the person who is adopting the dog. Um, so it's very important to liaise with official rescues, vital, because if you don't, there's no rescue backup. And if anything goes wrong with the, with, with the dog once, once he's adopted, then um, you're really stuck because there's nowhere to take the dog. <coughs> the rescue isn't able to help because they're in another country. Um, and very often what happens, sadly, is that other rescues in the UK get involved. Um, people will go to them and relinquish the dog if it's not working out. Um, but really, ideally, if a dog is being brought over, we need rescue backup. Um, from a rescue who is based in the country that he's coming to, so that if any support is needed, this can be given on the spot. Um, if the person needs advice or whether they need um, the dog to be moved temporarily, it doesn't have to be because the dog um, is having major issues. It can be a situation like illness in the family. There can be a number of reasons um, why dogs need to be moved. But very often, with the dogs who've come over that haven't come through a proper rescue, as I call it, um, a rescue who's based here as well, <coughs> excuse me, coughing, um, then the problem is that if anything goes wrong, no help's available. You're really stuck. So the thing to look for if you're thinking about adopting, and I know that at least one person who's here um, hasn't yet adopted a Romanian dog or um, an overseas dog, but is considering it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, find out as much information as possible, first of all. So whereabouts is the dog? Where is the rescue that's holding the dog? Are there contact details? Is there any charity status? Um, is there evidence of money that's sent over um, being used in the way that it's said to be being used. Is there feedback from adopters um, from those people as well? It's very important to find out as much as you can so that you don't end up in a sticky situation with a dog that maybe is a different gender to the one you think, who is much more scared than you expected, who in fact is feral rather than a stray or a street dog and is going to need years and years of support. He's a little shy. I put lost in translation here on the presentation because he, he's a little shy in um, some rescues overseas doesn't mean the same as he's a little shy does in the UK or the USA. Um, it tends to mean this dog is absolutely terrified and nobody can get near him at all and he's going to need an awful lot of help. So this is something to be aware of, you know, that, that phrase always strikes terror into my heart when I hear it because I just know that that dog is going to have enormous fear issues and is going to need an awful lot of help and I just hope that the person who has taken him in or her in is going to be willing to commit themselves to a massive life change for probably quite some time while the dog gets the help he or she needs. And preparation for homing. So all the dogs who are imported have their vaccinations, the rabies, parvo, distemper, lepto, infectious canine hepatitis. Some also have the kennel cough vaccine. Um, with the rabies vaccine, they have to wait three weeks. 
before being transported to the UK and 30 days for the US. So the minimum age for the rabies vaccination being three months. Puppies have to be at least four months old before they're brought over. In fact, very often they are much, much younger than that. The puppies who are sent over from puppy farms are tiny and haven't been vaccinated, which is an enormous risk um, to the other dogs. And not just dogs, but cats, wildlife, humans as well, if one did test positive for rabies. So it's that is a worrying situation that I wrote about for Dogs Today magazine um, last year, year before last, I think it was. Um, they'd be spayed and neutered unless they're tiny and microchipped. They should have a health check and an assessment before they come over. Um, and they have to have a tape worm, worm treatment one to five days before they travel. And transportation and arrival. Um, generally, dogs come in crates in a, a large van. There's you quite often up to 30 dogs in one van. Um, bear in mind the dogs have never been in a car or a van before. They've probably never been in a vehicle, so it's very stressful for them. Um, with the dogs who are packed 30 in a van, then the crates will be stacked. So the dogs don't have any opportunity to be taken out to toilet. Um, very often they're travel sick. It's a kind of very horrendous experience for them to go through. They're handed off at pre-arranged drop-off points around the country. Um, this is where a lot of the real problems tend to start because um, dogs do escape. Quite a few dogs escape. As, as I said at the beginning, you know, two people who were going to be here aren't here because um, they are out as part of a search party for a total of three dogs, two dogs in one place and one in another who've escaped. Um, and it's not surprising they try to make a getaway because they're terrified. Um, they don't always have a collar and lead on while they're actually in the transport van. So somebody has to get into the crate and get a collar and lead on a really scared dog who may well then just slip the collar. Harness is much, much better because it gives it, it means that they're harder to get out of. It gives you more control of the dog. You can hold on to the back of the harness rather than having your hand near the dog's mouth um, and face where it's going to be even more scary for the dog. And if the dog's terrified, you're more likely to get bitten. Um, so really, this is necessary, but it's not always happening. Um, so if somebody is picking up a dog, that they're fostering or they've adopted, it's vital to take a collar with a name tag attached, um, preferably a harness as well, and a lead to pick up the dog, to put on before they get the dog out of the crate and into the car. There's been a number of instances where dogs have been run over. There's been a number of instances where dogs have disappeared and never been seen again, um, and others where dogs have disappeared and have actually been brought back. But of course, they're in a strange country. They don't know anybody. They're very, very scared. So the instinct is to bolt. But it's too dangerous here. Once the dog arrives, so the dog's likely to be exhausted, very scared, might be shut down, may even be suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so it's a good idea to have everything set up before you bring the dog home. So set up a quiet area in the house um, where your dog will be left alone to just rest undisturbed. Um, set up a bed, water, food in that area. Um, collect the dog, making sure that everything is really secure. Um, and then take the dog into the garden first so that he can pee or poo before you bring him indoors and make sure there's lots of water available. When dogs are stressed, they pant a lot, and that means they need to drink a lot, and you're likely to find that they will drink an awful lot during the first few days um, while they're learning to cope with the new environment. So always have lots of water available. That also means, of course, that um, you need to give them lots of toilet breaks as well, and you may find that if your dog's very scared, you have to carry them into the garden initially. Certainly in the first um, 24, 
36 hours, I, 48 actually, come to think of it, I had to carry Charlie, my feral dog, into the garden because he was too scared to move. He was literally paralysed with fear um, for the first um, 36 hours, couldn't move at all and didn't toilet or anything. It was amazing that he'd never toileted in the house, but I carried him out into the garden and then he did go and then he stood there utterly terrified and I carried him back in again and, and did that until he felt safe enough to stand up on his own. Um, give lots of space. Don't make a fuss of the dog. Um, what tends to happen is that people want to make it up to the dog straight away. They will make a big fuss, they'll want their family to see the dog, they'll be really excited about this new arrival and it's actually the worst thing that can happen for the dog because he's already terrified and in an unfamiliar environment with people that he doesn't know and so for somebody to be approaching him, talking to him all the time, wanting to stroke him, wanting to cuddle him, if there's children around as well, it, it's totally overwhelming. He doesn't know what your intentions are. He may well perceive your intentions as being hostile rather than friendly. So give lots of space and be patient. Make sure there's food and water there. Give toilet breaks as frequently as possible so that the dog learns that the garden is the place to eliminate rather than indoors. Be aware that when dogs are very frightened, they will quite often wet themselves or poo themselves out of fear. So expect toilet accidents if you have a very scared dog and just clean them up quietly without making any fuss about it. It's not the dog's fault. Um, wait for the dog to come to you because everything is unfamiliar. If you approach the dog and you're going into his space, especially if you've managed to get him in a nice cozy bed in a corner away from everybody, then you really are encroaching on what will be his new territory and that's when people tend to get aggressive incidents happening. Um, wait for the dog to come to you and then make a gentle fuss rather than making a big fuss of him. Discourage visitors for at least the first week. I prefer it if it's two weeks really because it takes up to two weeks for the stress hormones to subside that I mentioned earlier. Um, but even if it's the first week, try to avoid having people round. Give the dog a chance to just settle in and relax and get to know you and find his way around the home. He will be figuring out who is his social group now, who, who is his new family. And if you've got people coming in and making a big fuss of him or even coming in and just coming into the environment and not particularly making a fuss of him during that first week or two, then he's going to be confused about who actually lives there as well. So try and have a very quiet first week, two weeks if you can possibly manage it, and give those stress hormones a chance to subside. And very importantly, don't expect the new dog to be like the homebred dogs that you know from here. If you haven't adopted or fostered um, a street dog or a feral dog in the past, then it can be quite a shock to see how much more fearful they are, um, that of course they haven't got house manners because they haven't lived in a home and they don't understand anything about living in a home and about being in close proximity to people. Also the fact that they have no choices, um, they can't escape, they are captive literally which is something I'll be talking about in a moment. Make sure everything's safe and secure for the dog and for the people in the environment because a frightened dog may bite or bolt if put any, under any pressure whatsoever, which is why it's more important to let the dog come to you than for you to go to the dog. Um, some, some dogs will escape at the slightest opportunity. Um, lots of them will, given the opportunity. And I know darned well that Charlie certainly would have done during the first six months if he'd had any chance whatsoever. Um, and it happens a lot, sadly. They're naturally used to roaming. They're used to being able to go where they want. So confinement, captivity is very, very difficult for a lot of them. So make sure that there's no opportunities to escape. Secure the boundaries. Make sure that fences are strong and are high enough not to be climbed over. I've heard of dogs climbing up ladders to escape. Um, 
don't open the front door if your dog's loose and has access to the front door. Put your dog in another room before you open the front door. Have safety gates up. Keep windows closed unless you've got top windows that you can open that won't open enough for the dog to squeeze through. And be very, very careful when you're entering and leaving the car and the home. Um, if a dog escapes, there's nothing familiar for the dog to return to. Um, that dog is gone, basically, unless somebody manages to catch him or her. Um, as I said earlier, dogs have died on the roads. Um, escaping from transport vans or from the adopter's car or the home and some have never come back when they've escaped so it's very important to make sure that the place is as secure as possible whatever environment you're in whether it's the house or the car um, when you're out keep the dogs on lead um, make sure that you take all precautions to make sure that dog doesn't escape um, if you have other dogs and you can separate them at first, it's a good idea to do that if possible. And then you can have calm introductions outside. Um, it can be overwhelming for the dog being brought in to be brought into a house and be pounced on by other dogs who want to sniff them all over and get to know them and find out who this new person is. And you may not actually take kindly to an intruder being brought in. And the intruder dog may not take kindly to being sniffed by the other dogs so introductions outside which um, can be fairly simple to do you just need to have all of the dogs on lead take them out beyond the garden to neutral territory have them at a distance to each other where they can just see each other lots of rewards food rewards especially are wonderful for this and gradually move them closer and if there's any signs of discomfort if you see that any of the dogs are looking um, unhappy or scared they're moving apart again take it slowly if your dog is your new dog is very afraid of your dogs at first then keep it separate keep him or her separate um, and then do gradual short introductions the best way to do it really is to have safety gates up and have dogs in rooms on either side of the safety gate so that they can't actually get to each other but they can see and hear each other they can pick up the scent and and that can help them get familiar uh, with each other's um, smells and they will learn to adapt to having that other dog around and it's more likely that they'll be able to make friends more easily some dogs of course just accept any dog coming in and are really happy i've been very lucky in that respect that Sky, my lurcher, has accepted all the dogs who've come to us, and there's been a lot of them over the years. And um, he just goes, "Oh, hi! You know what do you need? You need to rest. I'll let you rest. You want to play? Well, I'll let you play." So you know that's been wonderful for the dogs coming because it's allowed them to feel safe. But um, some dogs find it difficult because this is their home, their environment, and suddenly this strange dog has been brought in, and. Um, all the fuss is being made of that dog, which is another reason to not make a big fuss of a new dog. Um, you want to make sure that they're all comfortable in the environment. If you have children, make it a rule not to touch or follow the dog around, because if you have a dog who is very scared, who may not be used to children at all, then that could be a recipe for disaster, and you really don't want your child to be bitten, and you don't want the dog to be put in a position where he or she feels that they have no recourse, you know, no option other than to bite, to get away from the situation. Pet insurance and health issues. Um, so some of the UK rescues provide 28 days of this, but it's best to arrive your own insurance the, the day that your dog arrives. Because if there's any pre-existing conditions, they'll be exempted if you've had the 28 days of pet insurance from the rescue and then you go on. It's a very tricky situation is this because um, a lot of the dogs who've come over who I've worked with have had Demodex. It's very common, Demodectic Mange. Um, very easy to treat. Charlie had it and a staphylococcus infection and he had six weeks of antibiotics and treatment for Demodex and he was absolutely fine after that. But one dog um, who I know very well, beautiful, beautiful dog, um, she arrived with terrible demodex and staphylococcus infection. Um, it was classed as a pre-existing condition.
because she'd arrived with it and she didn't she'd already got insurance but because of the breed of the dog when she went to actually register the dog um, and pay for the insurance um, this was with pet plan they wouldn't accept um, insur insuring the dog they wouldn't agree to insure the dog because she was a Caucasian of Charka, a Caucasian Shepherd and they felt that that was on their banned list of um, dogs that they would insure. So, so they ended up in a horrendous situation where they did get insurance with um, another company, but by then the dog had to be under treatment. And it's been over two years now and she's still being treated. It's cost over £4,000 because she hasn't been able to claim on the vet fees. That's just for the vet treatment and tests. Um, and she spent a lot on complementary therapies as well. So, you know, if, if it's a very good idea to sort out insurance straight away, but please bear in mind that if your dog has something like Demodex or something very obviously wrong, then this will get classed as a pre-existing condition. Have the dog vet, check, dog vet checked as soon as you can, preferably at home, because it's even more scary being taken to a vet surgery. Um, if the vet will come to the home, then at least that environment is becoming familiar. Um, note any sore areas or fur loss, check worms, and anything that you're concerned about, discuss with your vet. Um, be aware that Demodex is very common and it's very easy to treat. It doesn't have to be a problem. Very often when a dog's immune system is very low, then, then they'll get Demodex. So it does mean that if you have a dog living with you already, your resident dog has a very low immune system, then they may possibly um, pick it up. But generally, Demodex you don't need to worry as much about. Um, if the dog's from the Mediterranean, then have checks for leishmaniasis. Um, because it does happen quite often it's caused by a bite from a sand fly and they can be very very sick with it but if it's um, diagnosed early enough and it's treated it's very treatable it's treatment for life it's not expensive treatment but it it really makes sense to the life of the dog um, be aware that tummy upsets are common due to stress and the new diet um, they've been through an awful lot they may not your dog may not want to eat much at first, or they may be starving. Um, it, it, it's up, you know, it's the individual dog really. Uh, but if it carries on, then check with the vet. And the settling in period, so give lots of time and space. Um, avoid any pressure to interact and protect the dog from unwanted attention. Lots of toilet breaks in the garden. Um, Wait at least two weeks before taking the dog outside the garden on the lead and harness, preferably. Um, that is because it will take all that time for the stress hormones to really fully subside. In that time, your dog is actually going to be gathering more stress from being in the home, being in a new environment, getting to know new people and new routines. And it's, it, it's a lot for a dog to cope with. So going out for walks on top of that is too much. For them really. Some dogs have never walked on a lead, um, Charlie certainly hadn't, and so you can practice walking on lead in the garden during that two weeks. But certainly give them the first week to settle to just get used to the environment and have lots of food rewards available for um, positive reinforcement. So anything that they're doing, if they come to you, if your dog comes to you, then have some food in your pocket. Have, always have a pocket full of treats. Um, if the dog has been jumping up for food when you at meal times and um, starts to sit as you're putting the bowl down or to move away then you can reinforce that with extra food anything that you want the dog to do you can reinforce with food rewards um, speak very quietly and move slowly um, try not to raise your voice and make sudden movements because this can really frighten them and if the dog's already fearful it can actually set up Quite a high degree of trauma which is going to take time to recover from and remember that the dog landed in an alien environment where he doesn't speak the environment the language or understand the house rules um, i mentioned earlier about confinement um, if you imagine that you've been able to go wherever you like 
anytime you want and suddenly you are locked in a room you can't escape meal times are set by somebody else you can't go and look for your own food you can't choose who you socialize with or who you escape from and you can't get away if you're scared you've also got the constraints of a collar and lead you've got people coming in you've maybe got other dogs around who you're not sure whether are friendly or not so you can imagine how scary this must be and how difficult it must be for a free-ranging dog so try to bear that in mind look at it from the dog's perspective and allow as many choices as you can even if these are very simple choices like um, when to come to you um, when to have any attention uh, when to go to the bed when to go in the garden make it just make it as simple as possible for the dog and how is this for you um, Suzanne Clottier actually coined that phrase and I love it it's been one of my favorites for years um, because basically what it means is looking at the dog and saying are you okay how are you feeling what's going on for you so it's it's observing the dog to see how he feels um, whether he's stressed or uncomfortable, whether he's happy and comfortable. Um, checking in constantly with the dog and bearing in mind that he may never have lived in a home or she. His senses are far more acute than yours are. So the hum of electric wires, household appliances, carpets, wooden floors are going to be really, really noisy for him. They can hear rats squeaking underneath the house, all sorts of things. Um, so bear that in mind when you switch the TV on he will never have experienced TV probably and is going to be really freaked out in the book I wrote um, about Charlie um, Charlie the dog who came in from the wild I, I described his reaction the first time I switched the television on and I turned the volume really really low so that it was barely audible for me and he shot out of the room and then crawled back in on his belly, utterly terrified, positioned himself where he could see it up on his elbows and growled at the TV and really wanted to see it off. He didn't understand what it was. And it took him a few days where I, I just put it on every so often for a little while and then turned it off again, kept the volume really low. And eventually he adjusted to it and he was fine. But you can imagine how alien everything is for them. So the hoover, the washing machine, tumble dryer, dishwasher, things that we don't even think about and that our dogs aren't bothered by at all. So make allowance, allowances. Um, teach the household gently. Have as few as possible um, and expect it to be a slow process. That way, if your dog adjusts really rapidly and everything is wonderful, then you have a pleasant surprise. If not, if it takes a long time, then you're expecting it. So it's no big deal. Listen with your eyes. So nonverbal communication is primarily how dogs express themselves. So this is just a quick run through of body language to look out for. Um, so uncomfortable, stressed, afraid, you're likely to see tucked back ears low body and tail, closed mouth, lip licking, panting, averted gaze, so looking away, the whites of the eyes visible, the sclera, um, that's called whale eye, blinking, yawning, a furrowed brow, cringing and rolling over, those are all markers of a dog who is very uncomfortable and very scared. Um, signs of imminent aggression, standing tall, staring directly at you, a challenging stare, especially unblinking, um, showing the whites of the eyes, um, whale eye again, but you will also see that the eyes seem to get bigger. You may see white all the way around the iris. Um, the ears pinned back or pricked, freezing, which can just be momentary. Um, a tight commissure, this is the area around the jaw and the mouth area. So if you imagine when you're really cross, you will purse your lips. You'll bring your lips together tightly and purse them and your jaw comes forward and your mouth comes forward and puckers. That's what happens when the commissure tightens in a dog. Um, generalized muscle tension, stiff 
raised tail and hackles up are all signs of imminent aggression. And signs of friendliness invitation are pretty easy to um, recognize with the relaxed face and ears. Very often the mouth is open, soft eyes, soft gaze, wagging tail, although a tail wagging doesn't always mean the dog's friendly. If it's loose, then it is a play bow and approaching you, coming to you. Um, a prolonged bow is asking for distance. It's not actually a play bow. It looks like a play bow that is held in position. And Charlie did this a lot at first. Um, and it's actually saying, I'm uncomfortable. Could you back off, please? And rolling onto the back isn't often an invitation for a tummy rub. It's usually an appeasement behavior. And there's a little picture of Ava with her loose, soft mouth, her soft eyes, and very relaxed face, looking happy. This is Charlie, um, looking very uncomfortable. When I took that photograph of him, he, I didn't actually see him licking his lip. He was in the garden, and I just aimed the camera at him. And in the moment that it took to press the shutter, he did this massive nose lick, which was saying, I'm really uncomfortable with you pointing that thing at me. I noticed he's staring directly at me as well. He really wasn't keen on that at all. And I didn't even see that until I uploaded the photo afterwards. It can be so fast. I'm very uncomfortable. Um, the two dogs in here, I know very well. Beautiful dogs, both of them. Um, the Dalmatian here was really wanting to play but she was being too pushy and you can see she's got her paw over this girl's leg so she's pinning her down she's got her other paw touching the chest and you can see this whole backward movement going on the head is turned away puckered mouth that's a tight commissure here whale eye you can very clearly see the whale of the white of her eye and her ears are pinned tight back. So she's really not happy about this situation. She's saying, you are really in my space and I don't like this at all. Fortunately, um, I was there at the time that this was taken and I called them away and they, they came away and they were absolutely fine. Then later on they played again. But at that point it was too much for, for her to cope with. Um, you expect me to be grateful. Um, actually, no. You know, it's funny how people quite often do expect a dog to feel gratitude for being brought into a home. But if you think about the life that the dog had before and the life they've got now, they might have comfort, regular meals, as much love as they can possibly absorb, um, company, an easy life in a sense it's still a very different life to the life that they've known and they may not enjoy it at first. Some of them do, but a lot of them take time to adjust. They've been uprooted from everything they've known. And so you may find behaviours like shrinking, bolting away if anybody looks at them, um, pacing, whining, barking or growling if anybody approaches, creeping on their belly, which is something Charlie did constantly during the first weeks. Um, or snapping if anybody goes near them. So this is your dog saying, I'm really uncomfortable, I'm nervous, I'm scared, and I just need space to learn to cope and adjust. So give him or her time and work on developing trust. And trust is something that really does have to be earned. You can never take trust for granted. So how to earn trust? Um, Help the dog feel safe, basically. Move slowly and speak softly and be predictable. Um, you only need one moment to lose it. Just one moment where you do something unpredictable or you shout, maybe if someone has called you from another room and you shout to call back to them and the dog isn't expecting it, then they can feel um, the target. So we'll be scared all over again and we'll then end up um, fearing you so you've got to start over again if that happens 
Um, I know with Charlie it was a big, big deal because he was so fearful that um, if the phone rang or if anybody came to the door and I moved quickly, then um, he would bolt. He'd just totally freak out. He'd bolt off thinking that something was going to happen to him and then he'd crawl back on his belly um, during the first few months and it was really distressing to see. So it meant that I had to completely change my lifestyle. I had to ignore the phone. If I wasn't near the door, I had to either hope that people would wait or just not answer it rather than run and um, take everything very, very slowly to make sure that he felt safe at all times. And it paid off. It paid off beautifully because he did learn to trust me. But there's always that element that you just need to do one thing out of character or make a big noise or something like that and it can really frighten the dog and you have to start over. So listen and see what helps the dog feel comfortable. Be very generous with praise and rewards. Don't ever speak harshly or tell the dog off. Don't shout, don't use aversive methods, um, which is methods that cause pain and discomfort to the dog, whether that's um, physical or psychological. Um, and protect the dog from unwanted attention from other people. Give them choices as far as possible because they are very, there are very few choices available to a free-ranging dog who's been brought into the home. So take it slowly. This is Charlie four months after he came to me and it was the first time he'd ever climbed up on the sofa. Bless his heart. I must admit I cried. Um, he suddenly just crept up looking as if he thought something awful was going to happen to him and snuggled into me and um, tucked his chin his head under my chin and I just cuddled him and so it was a very magical moment for us it had taken four months for him to get to the point where he felt safe enough to come up onto the sofa and after that he came up pretty much regularly and another few months later and he was every time I went on the sofa he'd be up there snuggling up with his head in my lap and sleeping on my bed as well so you know it was absolutely lovely and the outside world tends to intrude on the inside world because a lot of street dogs don't understand the new territorial boundaries. So what to you is the boundary of your home, your walls, your garden, um, isn't a boundary for a dog who's just moved in. They don't know where the boundaries are. It could be the space of the dog's bed or it could be miles away from the house. So. It's very common. I get a lot of phone calls about dogs who are constantly barking in the home with passers-by. Charlie did it for quite some time. He would even bark at leaves floating past the window and birds flying past for a while because he didn't understand the territorial boundaries. So anything that will ease that stress for them because it's hugely stressful, um, anything you can do to help that would be great. I put static film over the windows that you just buy in rolls from a DIY store, um, wipe the window um, with a damp sponge and then roll the film on and it sticks. And it just um, lets the light in, but it's opaque, so it means that your dog can't see out. For us it worked a dream and I've seen it work with lots and lots of other dogs when I've suggested it to their people as well. Um, it was instant silence. And um, Charlie could relax. He didn't feel that he was being intruded on all the time. And um, the barking stopped. And his stress levels went right down. And after three months, I took the film down to see whether he could cope then because he was so much more relaxed in the home and, and generally really happy. And it didn't bother him at all. He got, he'd adjusted by then to the point where he understood the territorial boundaries much more closely. So, so that can be really useful if you have a dog who can't cope with what's going on outside and isn't sure if it's outside or inside. With doorbells, either you can create a positive association um, by giving food, getting someone to ring the doorbell but not come in and give food and keep ringing the doorbell. Each time the doorbell rings, food arrives and graduate to 
the dog going on a mat or sitting wherever you want the dog to be when anybody comes in and somebody just opening the door and then leaving again and giving food so that the dog learns not to be scared, not to be fired up by this happening. In fact, all that's happening, there isn't anybody really coming into his space. All that's happening is nice things. So, and then you can build on that where somebody comes in and your dog is feeling much more comfortable. Keep the treats handy as well though. You can also do this with door knockers. You can lower the volume of your doorbell if that's another thing that causes an issue. If it's a very loud one, it can be quite startling. So you can lower the volume or ask people to knock and just disable the doorbell temporarily. Because at some point in the future, you most likely will be able to go back to normal. And hypersensitivity. Um, all dogs are highly sensitive to our emotions. There's been a lot of research done into this. It's fascinating. Um, and they're very sensitive to our heightened emotions, particularly. And street dogs, even more so. All dogs will do this to keep themselves safe, but street dogs especially, because a lot of them aren't safe on the streets. There is a lot of abuse and cruelty that goes on. So they need to understand whether someone is going to be friendly and give them food or a pat or uh, whether they're going to kick them or worse. Um, dogs are the only animals other than humans who use what's called left gaze bias, which is where when a person is facing the dog, um, if you're facing your dog, your dog will look to the right of your face um, in order to decipher your emotions because uh, We'll look to the left, sorry, to decipher the emotions that are showing on the right side of your face. Um, so it's very interesting. There's been some new research just done into this, as well as the research by Dr. Gun Guo and Dr. Kirsten Mainz and, and Professor Daniel Mills. So it is quite fascinating. But it's interesting that dogs instinctively know to look to the, on the right side of our faces to see what we're feeling in order to keep themselves safe. Some dogs are very sweet and sympathetic if there's any sign of emotional weakness. Other dogs aren't and will actually respond aggressively. Um, there could be a number of reasons for this, but it, it could be partly that when they're on the streets or for feral dogs when they're living wild, then any, any member of the group who's weak actually could be a threat to the entire group and so they will drive them off very often so it depends some dogs will be very sweet and come and cuddle you and lick your face if you're crying other dogs won't and i've seen both sides of this so it and it is quite unnerving if you're feeling upset and the dog is suddenly acting aggressively towards you because of this so you may need to monitor your emotional and physical states very closely and check these against your dog's behaviour. So if you've noticed that your dog is more reactive when there's a lot of emotion going on in the room, um, then you can take steps to calm things down in the environment as much as possible. Um, fear issues are very common and not really surprising because of the huge transition that your dog's going through. So just be aware of this, be aware of the change. Gentle reassurance can help. There's been a school of thought for a long time that um, you shouldn't pay any attention to a dog when they're scared, um, that you should ignore them completely or even move away from them um, because you could reinforce that fear. In fact, what's, what's been discovered has been that it's not like that at all gentle reassurance is good if you make a big fuss of a dog who's scared then yes you are going to reinforce that fear but just a gentle stroke and quietly saying it's okay no need to worry and that will help your dog to relax be your dog's champion it helps your dog feel safe if he can look to you and if he knows that if he's frightened that you'll be there for him um, use management to keep your dog safe while he learns to trust you. Um, if there's situations that he finds difficult to cope with, like being around other dogs 
or people coming into the home, then make sure that he has the space that he needs and that he isn't put in a situation where he becomes more fearful, where he's not able to cope. Um, so whatever management strategies you need, you can put in place. That might be, if it's visitors coming into the home, this may be um, having a child gate up and having your dog in another room so they can see the visitors and um, every so often throwing a nice little tasty something over the child gate so that good things happen when people are around but the dog isn't being forced to interact with the people. Um, Barch flower remedies can actually be very good. Um, probably most of you will have heard of rescue remedy um, but there's actually 38 remedies and mimulus, larch and walnut are also very useful for dogs with fear issues. Um, mimulus is for very specific fear issues. So say it's a fear of men um, or a fear of other dogs, something that is a known issue, then mimulus is great. Rescue remedy is good for all shock and trauma and fear. Um, larch is to help build confidence. So if a dog is very anxious, larch can help. Walnut is something I ask everybody to give to their rescue dogs when they bring them home, um, along with rescue remedy, because walnut is for helping to cope with change, and these dogs have had an incredible change in their lives. Um, other things that can help are zoopharmacognosy, Tellington Touch, and homeopathy are all fantastic. If a dog has severe fear issues, you may not need them if they're just mild ones, but if they're very severe, then just bring in as much as you can in the way of complementary therapy. Make sure also, of course, that your dog is well checked over by a vet so that oops, um, there's no, no possibility that there could be a health issue involved that's sparking it off too. Aggression issues, again, these are very common, um, often seen in the early days as a fear response, which when you think back to that horrible photo of the dog being caught by the dog catcher, it's not really surprising that, you know, that dog may well react to people aggressively. Um, <coughs> so this does happen in the early days with some dogs, not with all of them. Um, and some dogs may seem quite shut down for even a few months and then we'll start to exhibit aggression issues after months in the home. I've actually, I get so many calls about this that I think it's actually become quite a common thing. Um, it could be that the dog has got settled, has finally um, released the stress. It can take a long time to release the stress of all the upheaval that he's been through. And um, at the point that the dog becomes more confident about the environment, then they may start to get territorial or they may start to react aggressively towards um, emotional states in the people around them or towards other dogs in the home. Um, dog aggression might be seen in the early days, but often I found I get called when it's happened later on after a dog has actually settled in. So again, the dogs are shut down initially. They're too scared to really react. They're kind of trying to find their way around, figure out the environment and the beings in the environment. And so they're going to be much quieter generally than they are once they settle in and unpack their baggage and start to get used to life in a home. On the streets, of course, a dog can flee if they want to avoid a fight. They can just make a run for it. Um, they can't do this in a home or when they're on lead. So it's not surprising that they find it very difficult um, in that sense. So use a safety gate if you need to keep visitors safe, if the dog is showing aggression towards humans. Call in a force-free behaviourist who's qualified. Um, make sure you keep the dog safe and everybody else safe. And also be aware of the dog laws. I will... Um, put some links with the video of this when I put it up on YouTube um, with, and one of the links will be to a slideshow that CO Stewart and I created called Beware of the Dog Laws um, last year that makes it very simple to understand um, 
the repercussions that can happen basically and the fact that your dog doesn't have to bite somebody um, for them to prosecute that person only has to feel in danger of being bitten that the dog could bite them um, have reasonable fear that that could happen and you could end up in a horrible situation with the law so I'll put the link in for that too it's very important to understand and food issues um, the dogs were most likely have experienced hunger it's more likely than anything else that the dog will have gone very hungry in the past um, so food is a very precious resource so give space um, a great way to help dogs adjust to eating from a bowl indoors is to walk past casually at a distance and just lob something extra that is even tastier than the meal that he's having into the bowl as you walk past so that he starts to look up at you as you go past and hope for something else rather than feel that he's got to guard the bowl um, mugging for food is very common because they don't understand the house rules it's not just street dogs um, and feral dogs that will do all of this of course um, any dogs will and I've had quite a lot of fosters who've done it when they first arrived um, so if a dog won't let you eat if they're mugging you then if you've got a table obviously it's easier to sit up at a table um, if if you're sitting on the sofa trying to eat a bag of crisps or something and the dog is bothering you and trying to get them off you and I know in the early days Charlie would actually come and put his paw on my shoulders to try and get my meal and um, so one very easy way to do it if you're quite low down is to block with your body and a book I used to just get a book and hold it up in front of the plate and I quite like reading anyway when I'm eating so it was perfect for me and um, and that way he couldn't actually get over the book it created this barrier and if he tried to get around to the side I would just move sideways a little and this is something I've seen work with a lot of dogs who have been food muggers basically um, I've been out and worked with a lot of them in the homes who have and it's been quite interesting to see how well they respond to that very simple method counter surfing is common because they don't know that the food that you put up there isn't for them um, so what you can do is just step in the way not tell the dog off or anything like that just sideways slide in and block him um, and then as soon as his paws are on the floor reward him for having his paws on the floor and he'll learn not to do that anymore stealing well you know any food that is around is obviously fair game really so just don't leave food around um, food guarding um, what I was saying about the walking past and putting some food in the bowl um, that that works pretty well but make sure that he has a space of his own when he's eating so that he doesn't feel the necessity to do it any behavior that is practiced that is given the opportunity to be practiced over and over again is going to become much harder to resolve because it will be entrenched and what you want is for the dog to feel safe and not feel that he's got to fight for every morsel don't ever pick up a food bowl when a dog's eating or try and take food from him um, it always amazes me that that does happen so much but you know just imagine if you were having a delicious meal and you were starving and you didn't know when your next meal would be coming and somebody suddenly took your meal off you you, you probably would lunge at them too so try and look at it from the dog's perspective um, coprophagia this is eating eating poo very common um, certainly I've seen an awful lot a lot of dogs do it generally but certainly a lot of street dogs and feral dogs will do it um, when they've gone hungry then you know somebody else's poo contains whatever they've eaten and maybe not digested all of it so that is one reason for it it can become a habit um, but again just don't give them the opportunity to do it be very vigilant uh, so that they can't develop that habit and hopefully once they've, they've been well fed for a while then they will be fine they won't need they won't feel the need to do that um, Pika is eating um, swallowing objects that aren't actually food um, it could be anything 
and that is quite common as well. It can be stress related. Um, it can be to do with health issues as well. So get the dog checked out and um, again keep all objects that the dog seems to be attracted to out of the way. You know, if, if, if he wants to swallow socks then make sure there's never any socks around. Keep them all tucked away. Separation anxiety is pretty common in a lot of dogs. It's probably one of the most common issues other than dog aggression, really. Um, he's probably never been on his own before. Just think he's been in a, a group, either on the streets, in a very fluid group of dogs who have come and go, who he's perhaps known some of them, not known others, and just interacted with whoever he's felt like interacting with. Um, so for a dog to come into a home and not only be in a strange environment in prison but to actually be all by themselves and feel that perhaps nobody will ever return and that could be the end of them you know it's very very scary for them so take measures right from the beginning so that you can avoid any separation anxiety um, stay with them as much as possible at first and just to have short gaps, go to the loo, close the door, go have a shower, close the door, um, just briefly come back, don't make a big fuss about it. If the dog is following you, then wait until the dog goes and settles somewhere and then give the praise. Um, don't make a big deal about any following around. Change your leaving routine and um, go through that leave and then come straight back in again and do something else so that you're not actually leaving the house. So that they become desensitized to that routine and don't get anxious at the first signs of you picking up your keys or your mobile phone. Um, through a dog's ACD is fantastic. That can help a lot. Um, there's also apps now. I've been, I haven't got it. I really would like to see it. I haven't seen it personally yet, but there is one where you can tune in. You can actually speak to your dog. They can, you can see the dog, so they can hear your voice. So. That's something to look into with a dog that gets very anxious too. Leaving the radio on can help as long as it's not going to be something that's very noisy. Have it on very quietly. And pet remedy, diffuser and spray is really good for helping dogs to feel calmer. Also butch flower remedies. So chicory is for over dependence. Heather is for what I call the Velcro dog, a dog who sticks to you all the time and is also very vocal. Um, dogs who bark and whine a lot and are always by your side are kind of the heather type and honeysuckle is when they pine when you leave so that's something to bear in mind as well and the great or not so great outdoors so your dog's been used to going where he or she wishes um, they don't let them off lead initially until you are absolutely certain that the recall is perfect or as near perfect as it can be. Um, use a long line. Extendable leads cause an awful lot of damage. They don't always work. If the ratchet doesn't hold, the dog can just shoot off. You can get very badly cut on them. Other dogs can get badly cut, and they can get tangled um, if there's another dog involved. So I tend to prefer that people don't use those. But a long line is great, because the dog has got a sense of freedom, um, especially if it's a minimum 30-foot line. They can wander about, they can have a good sniff. You can use that for teaching recall and know that your dog isn't going to just disappear over the horizon. Um, unwanted attention from other dogs and people is horrendous to cope with. Um, if you just imagine that you were feeling quite anxious to start with and all of a sudden all these strangers converge on you and start patting you on the head and pushing at you, and you'd feel pretty upset yourself. So that is not fun dogs very often especially when they can't escape um, so it's good to protect them step in and say please don't bother my dog or please can you call your dog away so that they feel protected um, hypervigilance is very common um, it's where the dog is on alert on red alert all of the time is really tense is looking around is poised to flee at the slightest thing um, so one way you can help them is to try 
everything you can to make them feel more secure, which would start in the home before you even go out for a walk. Um, and teach your dog to focus on you. So whether it's treats or a toy, have something that your dog really likes with you so that you can get them to focus on you rather than what's going on around you. And they, that makes it much easier for them to relax. And at first, use the same area for walks so that there is some sense of familiarity built up for the dog uh, before you start expanding the horizons. Um, the prey drive is very strong in um, feral dogs and dogs who've been used for hunting in the past. And I know that this is something that a lot of people um, have come to me about. Um, it can be directed at smaller dogs and cats. So work on redirecting that as much as possible because the point is once the prey drive really kicks in, if, if your dog sees a squirrel or a rabbit or a rat or something in the distance or even a small dog and, and the prey drive really kicks in, then he's not going to hear you. He'll just be off like a shot. He won't even be aware of your presence by then because his instincts are too strong. So be aware of everything that's going on in the environment. Don't have your dog off lead. If there's any possibility that something could spark off the prey drive, use a lovely long line instead and find a secure space for off lead walks and runs. Um, redirect it. You can use a fluffy toy, which will be far more rewarding for a dog um, who has got a high prey drive. So as soon as you see the slightest signs of anything going on that your dog may react to, then get the fluffy toy out, get their attention on you and on playing so that um, he's working with his instincts, but safely rather than going off to do something else. And when visitors arrive, um, dogs can be very scared when new people come in. Some dogs, some dogs love visitors and are friendly to everybody, but very often dogs find it quite scary in the early days. So ask visitors not to go over to the dog, not to stroke him or look at him or speak to him. Give him space um, and give him the choice. If he wants to go and say hello, then he can. And that way, he's much more likely to feel comfortable around people and to want to go and say hello. Um, it can help to give visitors some treats as they come in and ask them to throw these further away. So if the dog is two feet away as the visitors come through the door, then ask the visitors to throw the treats four feet away so that the dog has to retreat. I use this with Charlie when he was very scared at first of people coming. I just give people treats as they came in and say, can you throw them into the kitchen, which was behind him, because they wouldn't, they couldn't come into the living room because he would be blocking the area to the living room, but too scared to come forward and not know what to do with himself. And um, so he would freeze. So they would throw treats over him into the kitchen and he would go rushing off to get those. I could get everybody into the living room and then he would come through when he felt comfortable about it. And after a short while, he'd come up and just sit and give paws to people and make a big fuss of them. And he started to absolutely love having visitors coming and being first to greet them at the door after a while. So, you know, it's a very simple method, but it does work. Um, so that gives a dog chance to gain distance and have rules. I had the Charlie rules, as I called it, which was don't look at him when you come in, make a fuss of sky, my lurcher, don't look at Charlie, um, don't speak to him, don't give him any attention whatsoever. Just go and sit down, play with Sky. let Charlie choose to come into the room when he's ready and let him come to you if he wants to. And it worked. It worked really well. As I said, he became a very sociable dog. So it is a matter of time. And meeting other dogs is difficult for street dogs and feral dogs when they've been on lead, when they're on lead rather, and they're having no choices. Um, dogs can come over to them and they can't escape. So this is where you're likely to get either big fear issues of a dog who's trying to hide behind you desperately or aggression issues where um, a dog just has got no choice in his own mind um, other than to attack to try and create distance between himself and the dog who's so rudely coming into his space. So protect your dog from unwanted attention. Watch the body language um, with introductions. And if you're thinking about taking your dog to training classes, 
wait until some socialization has been well and truly learned outside the home. You don't want to put your dog into a situation that he's going to find very difficult to cope with. So socialize outside first and then start training classes if you want to. And expect aggressions. A lot of dogs have the equivalent to PTSD and there can be all sorts of triggers that set this off. So it could be anything as simple as um, somebody in the family going away on holiday or for a weekend and there being different people in the home or one less person in the home. <coughs> it could be somebody not being well or somebody raising their voice in an argument or just to make a point. So um, just see if you can figure out what causes um, the triggers that set off any form of aggression so that that way you can take steps to avoid those happening again so you're prepared but it does mean that each time there is a regression you'll probably need to start again at the beginning and rebuild trust with the dog because that will have been lost up to a point and think about what's causing the regression what are the triggers um, trigger stacking is when something happens that isn't terribly pleasant for the dog but the dog copes um, so say um, somebody new comes into the home the dog's absolutely fine with that it's just either happy to say hello or to go to their own space um, and then somebody else turns up and maybe they've got a dog with them and your dog is feeling pretty uncomfortable by then and not really sure about the situation um, and then maybe one of your kids brings a strange child in and that could be the final straw really so one thing that they find difficult a second thing they find difficult and then something else um, where there's an explosion and and quite often you'll think well you know what set that off I didn't realize you know he seemed fine up until then which they do it, it's it's a point where the dog just cannot cope they've been trying desperately to cope and they cannot cope any longer so do your best to avoid anything that causes discomfort use as much management as possible when you can while you're helping the dog to adjust um, then the storm after the calm so some dogs unpack their baggage and kind of show their true selves quite quickly others may take months um, some dogs are very shut down for months and then when their confidence develops will be very different. Um, so rough patches, just expect them. If you don't have any, then fabulous. Just appreciate it and enjoy it. Um, if you do, then don't be discouraged. Just think, OK, well, this is quite normal. This is just something that we can work through. And if you need help, call in a qualified force-free behaviourist. Um, another thing I felt was very important was um, when dogs have gone into foster, they've already gone through all the things that I've described so far in the presentation. Um, but then when they're moved to an adoptive home, they're back to square one very often. It's another massive burden of trauma for them to go through. Everything that they've adjusted to has suddenly disappeared. And they understand houses and they understand cookers and washing machines and TVs probably by then, but they're with unfamiliar people in an unfamiliar environment. And so you can expect them to be very stressed at that point. One thing that I know it's not possible with all rescues, but one thing that can really help is for the prospective adopter to visit the foster home several times, to take the dog for walks, to have play times, to be there, to feed the dog at one of the feeding times and then have a visit to the home followed by an overnight stay or even a weekend stay um, and then do the adoption after that. It just eases a lot of stress for the dog. It gives some transition time and it means that the environment is starting to feel slightly more familiar and the people are feeling more familiar. It can also help if an item of clothing belonging to the adopter is left in the foster home before adoption in the dog's bed so that they can get used to the scent. And once they do move into the adoptive home, try to keep the routine similar, certainly during the first few weeks while they're adjusting um, so that the dog feels more secure. So if they have food 
at a certain time or walks at a certain time, then try and stick to that initially and then just gradually phase in whatever routine you want to set in place if it's different. Um, the definition of rescue, so it implies a happier, healthier life for the dog. The five freedoms from the Animal Welfare Act 2006 are freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury and disease, freedom from fear and distress and freedom to exhibit normal behaviours. Um, the first three are very easy for us to offer to the dogs to actually uphold. The second, the final two, fear and distress and the freedom to exhibit normal behaviours, is much harder with a street dog and a feral dog because they are transplanted into a completely new world. They will be fearful, they will be distressed. They can't exhibit the normal behaviours of um, being able to just take off whenever they want to, to travel where they, where they like, to be around their friends or to be alone. So this is something that can be very difficult. So what other solutions are there um, with dogs who aren't coping particularly? Um, and some dogs never do adjust well to being in a home. Most of them fortunately do, but need specialised care in some cases. But there are some who really find it very, very difficult. And basically, I know several dogs who just live in the home environment, um, don't really interact with the people and the other dogs in the environment, just go their own way um, and live quite a lonely life, really. So adoption for dogs who've been assessed as able to cope with home life, obviously. Um, support organisations such as ASNI. We have lovely Aurelian Stefan here today, who's the medical director of ASNI. Um, they provide free spay neuter programmes in the home country. Um, trap neuter release for dogs who really wouldn't be able to cope um, in a home. And this includes some of the true feral dogs who never do adjust well. Um, it's quite a cruel life to keep them in captivity. Um, I know that this is also a difficult one with the TNR um, in countries where the dogs are likely to undergo cruelty or abuse. It's a very difficult situation and there is no easy answer for it, unfortunately. Um, and raise funds for sanctuaries where dogs who aren't considered homeable could lead happier lives. Um, another thing I think could be really useful would be raising funds for specialised fostering programmes where unsocialised dogs can be safely rehabilitated. Um, lots of behaviour work done um, and lots of training for the fosterers as well, which would involve fundraising because training isn't cheap. And qualities to cultivate in yourself. So patience, compassion, understanding, kindness using positive methods, empathy, not sympathy. If, if you're feeling sympathetic and you're thinking about what a terrible life that dog has had in the past and you want to make it up to them, you're not really doing the dog any favours because that dog isn't thinking about his past, he's thinking about now and what's going on and how he can cope in that moment. So by you being empathic and understanding his feelings and helping him with all the tools at your disposal to cope, then that will do him far more good than sympathy. Um, a knowledge of body language, self-awareness, which means understanding your body language and how you are in different situations, um, so that you, your dog isn't reacting to what you're doing. You're not making your dog more stressed. Um, consistency is vital. Taking responsibility for the dog in every sense. Um, and also taking responsibility for keeping the dog safe. So taking responsibility for everyone who comes into the environment, to all the influences in the environment that your dog will be exposed to. Um, and fortitude, endurance, and willingness to deal with challenges, and and willingness to possibly need to make significant changes in your lifestyle, which certainly with some people they do have to. I had to for a while, and um, Charlie came through the other side of it beautifully and turned into one of the most wonderful dogs imaginable. Um, 
but you know I had a long period of time where I couldn't go out where I, I didn't leave him um, because he was in such an emotional state um, where I covered up the windows where I didn't have visitors for a while and then gradually introduced people in a way that he could cope with and it paid off but it did mean that my lifestyle changed quite a bit for a few months it's worth it if you're willing to do it um, because your dog your dog will really show how much happier he or she is and you will really reap the rewards and unconditional love however tricky things may be and however good things may be the love still needs to be there and that's Charlie the rewards of adopting a street dog he's playing with his ball he's pounding his paws on the ground in his hunting thing that he used to love doing um, we had an incredible relationship. Charlie died very suddenly last April and it was utterly devastating losing him because we had a bond that is just impossible to put into words. I wrote a book about him um, and about how I worked with him, um, the methods that I used, um, which is published by Hubble and Hattie, Charlie the dog who came in from the wild. And Dale McClelland and I wrote the Dogs BFF Award for adopters and fosterers in particular. It's available to anybody who wants to get to know dogs better, but it's a little £9.99 nine uh, course where you have a 73-page course book and an, an, an eight-point questionnaire. And you just read the book, answer the questions um, at the end of it and send those in, and then you get your certificate to say you've earned the Dogs BFF Award. It's being used by a lot of rescues for their volunteers and adopters. Um, and there's a very strong focus on body language and behaviour. There's lots of photos in there and there's six videos there as well because it's one of the most important things that we can learn is canine communication. So you can find out about that on the ISPP website if you want to. And then I'm going to introduce you to Aurelian. Find him on the list. There he is. Um, I think he's turned his own microphone off. Hang on. Aurelian, if you would like to... Oh, I'm trying to unmute him. Aurelian, you have... Uh, oh, here he is. Yeah, hello. So, hi. So, this is Dr. Aurelian Stephen, who is Medical Director... Hello, everybody. Anthony. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear perfectly. Thank you. I hope everyone um, can hear me as well. Well, um, uh, are you done with your presentation? Yes. Yes. Lisa? If you would All like right, to so, say a few words about Adley. Um, well, thank you for inviting me uh, with you tonight. Um, shortly, uh, Animal Spaniard International is uh, basically the same thing as Romania Animal Rescue. So Romania Animal Rescue is registered in UK as Animal Spaniard International. Also in USA is the same thing. So Romania Animal Rescue, Animal Spaniard International is the same thing. Um, in so you will hear a lot about RAR and ASNI. Well. RAR comes from Romanian Animal Rescue and ASNI comes from Animal Spay and Utah International. It's the same thing, it's just how those how is how we are registered. So in UK we are registered under Animal Spay and Utah International. And uh, we focus on helping in Romania but also in other parts of the world. We've been in Suriname, we've been in the Dominican Republic. Uh, I personally have been in Cape Verde, Gabon, uh, Mexico, and of course Europe, Portugal, Greece, um, where, where animals needed veterinary help and people just couldn't pay for it or there were no vets or no skilled enough to perform, um, let's say, surgery. And one of the most important surgeries is the sterilization surgery because um, unfortunately, there's a flood of new animals that at least twice a year you know we, we, we see um, everywhere on the streets and um, 
definitely, definitely, this comes from a lot of intact animals that reproduce uh, randomly with no absolutely control, absolute control. And we focus in Romania on four major targets. And first of all is mass spay and neuter. And uh, we've traveled across Romania. We help shelters. We help um, local communities that need mass spay and neuter that understand that they need to have a base to start with um, animal welfare in their areas. And this is putting a stop on the overpopulation. And so far we've performed, I think, we are over 44,000 surgeries uh, performed in Romania and abroad, but most of them are in Romania. Um, we, have a, we have a project which is now, we celebrate actually its third year. It's called Homeless Animal Hospital is a project that is aimed towards uh, pets, stray dogs, shelter animals that uh, need medical care and high quality medical care. We're talking about uh, bone surgeries, we're talking about tumor removals, we're talking about very complicated stuff that can be performed for free or in subsidized form, depends on the donations we get. Um, we do have a training program where vets from basically all over the world, um, UK, USA, Switzerland, Greece, Slovakia, Poland, you name it, visit us. They spend um, 10 to 14 days with us and they learn how to perform nice, decent uh, surgeries. They go back and promote Spain as a as a very powerful tool to um, promote animal welfare because this is all it all starts, where, where it all starts. It starts with the puppies, right, that flood the streets. It starts with the um, overpopulation, basically. So finally, we, we also um, have printed about 17,000 booklets uh, that uh, are aimed for the kids. So they learn about animal welfare um, by, by games. They have special games in that booklet. And uh, we provide this for free, of course. And we're very, very happy to have printed, I think it's over 17,000 booklets for Romanian kids. So um, this, is, this has been um, a very, very hard work. Uh, we're a team of six veterinarians at the moment. And it's, the team is always the same. We travel uh, quite long distances in Romania. We travel 14 hours, 15 hours um, to go uh, to the remotest areas in Romania. Hopefully, we I mean, the goal would be to train somebody there, but most of the times nobody's there. Um, so we have to do the job. And now, um, our latest... Uh, our latest project is to build a Spain Utah Center. Um, probably many of you know already that uh, we are building a Spain Utah Center near Bucharest. And um, this is actually a medical center, an animal center, um, where uh, Spain Utah is going to be uh, the main uh, objective. Um, Homeless Animal Hospital, our project, is going to have a new. Um, new branch, so to say, because we are uh, at the moment working in Craiova, um, where the clinic is. So uh, and again, the veteran trainings are going to have a new facility. And uh, because the, the plot is quite big, uh, there's going to be a lot of educational activities for the, for the kids in the area. And the most important part is that this center is located outside Bucharest. Uh, and a little bit of the Romanian background is that towns have been designed egocentrical. You know, everything um, was intended to go to, to the center. Well, what we are aiming with this new uh, animal center is to be located outside Bucharest and to aim all the poor areas around Bucharest. And um, I've calculated that we can cover an area of a radius of, of 100 kilometers. So um, 
animals can be brought to us uh, by vans or individuals can be um, can can take their own animals to us and we'll provide free spay and neuter for as many animals as donations will allow and more. Um, so basically this center is going to be a absolute uh, cornerstone in Romanian animal welfare. Uh, we're going to be able to provide accommodation for the visiting vets, vet technicians, uh, shelter people, anyone that would be interested and will be interested to learn and to, and to hang out with us basically. Um, will have a place to stay and this this is very very important so upstairs um, there's going to be rooms for people visiting there's going to be six rooms uh, which is <laughs> not bad uh, for people visiting for vets for um, everyone that is interested in in helping or learning um, we're looking forward to this and hopefully we'll be ready in October and the opening will be somewhere mid-October for the center uh, and um, I, would I would like to uh, say a big thank you for um, to all of you that adopt an animal from Romania. Definitely, there's a big need in those animals that are in shelters, on the streets. Uh, you guys do a remarkable job. Those animals do have issues. Not everybody, not, 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 there are no perfect pets, basically. Um, so you do a wonderful job uh, taking a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of patience by uh, s slowly introducing those animals um, to basically a, a family and a new life. Um, I'm really, really, really grateful to all of you people that adopt an animal. It doesn't matter if it's from Romania, but a homeless animal really, really um, makes can make a great pet. But a lot of effort sometimes is needed to to make. To, to, to actually extract the the best from that particular animal. So um, um, I've always thought that animal welfare is um, a joint thing. is not only spay and neuter. It's not only adoptions. It's a mixed thing. So um, thank you for for doing this. And uh, of course, without your help, a lot of animals would be on the streets. So. Um, if you have any questions, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of, uh, of things to talk about, I can yeah, thank tell you about. There's, there's very so much that we could talk about. I've just realized we've been going almost two hours, so probably a lot of people will have to leave in a moment. But thank you so much. Um, I'm sure that all of you know that the, the funds that have been raised through this presentation um, are going to ASME, so I'll be sending that over to them um, tomorrow morning. Um, so thank you, all of you, who have contributed towards the new Spain Neuter Centre that uh, Aurelian is so involved in, is creating. Um, I think as it's gone on quite late, if any, has anybody got um, any questions or would you like to just email, if there's anything that you particularly wondered about, would you like to just shoot me an email and I'll have a look at them tomorrow. Um, you've all got the email address, um, which I will show here, um, so you can get in touch if you need to. And just to say thank you very much to all of you for coming. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it that you've also been so much interest, and uh, and I hope that you found it useful in some way. So thank you, everybody, and have a really good evening, what's left of it. Take care, then. Bye. Thank you.